Welcome to the Mound City Council meeting for Tuesday, May 28th at 6 o'clock. Can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks for coming out. This is our first 6 p.m. meeting. And uh, I don't know if our attorney got the message, but anyway, he'll be eventually here. So. All right, we got the agenda. Can I get, or do we have any uh, amendments at all? No amendments. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? We'll make a motion to approve the agenda. All right, and can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that passes. Then we got the consent agenda. Does someone want to go through those? I can do that. Okay. Um, all right, consent agenda, starting with item A, approved payment of claims. B, approved minutes from the May 15th regular meeting and May 15th workshop. C, approved resolution of sponsorship related to Southwest Trails Snowmobile Association. D, approved resolution approving expansion permit. Um, for project at 4870 Edgewater Drive. E, approve resolution approving permits for 2024 Spirit of the Lakes Festival. Uh, on Thursday, July 18th through Saturday, Saturday, July 20th. F, approve resolution approving public lands permit for fence in Ruby Lane. Um, right of way adjacent to property at 2567 Emerald. G, pay request number three and final amount for $23,377 and 25 cents to buy two minutes roadways. Um, H, pay request number four in the final amount of $3,437 and four cents to Pember Companies for lift station improvement project. And I, pay request number four in the amount of 16,135 and 27 cents to Minger Construction for lift station project. All right, does council want to talk about any of those? All right, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, got a motion. Can I get a second? Second. All right, roll call, please. Councilmember McEnany. Here. Councilmember Pugh. Here. Councilmember Castellano. Here. Mayor Holt. Aye. Anyway, does that count? I think it counts, yeah. All right, all that passes. All right, number five, we got comments and suggestions from citizens present that their topic is not on the agenda. Does anybody want to come up? All right, hearing nobody, uh, so we'll go to number six, the Be Like Tommy presentation. You guys want to come up? <coughs> Like, can you just give us your name and address? Here? Yeah, you have to do it in front of the mic. Okay. Uh, I'm Kevin Nash, and this is my wife, Nicole Nash, and we live at 6044 Hermitage Trail, technically in Minnetrissa. Okay. Cool. Well, again, thank you guys for coming out. I ask you guys to come out and tell us about your um, foundation and, you know, maybe just a brief background of, you know, how it got started and then also what you got coming up. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. So yeah, one, thanks for having us. I think it's always good for us just, you guys have probably seen some things around town and maybe a, like, a lot of people wonder like, who are these people and what is this thing? So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. So uh, we both, actually, I always start with, so we have four beautiful children. Our oldest is 20, going on 21 soon, and our youngest is a freshman at Mamostanka High School. We've got a senior at Mamostanka as well. And then we also had, who would be a junior in high school, our son, Tommy. So three girls and one boy. And in December of 2021, the four kids were at the neighbor's house sledding when Tommy fell with sudden cardiac arrest and was hospitalized that night and he passed away the next morning. Um, so this community really rallied around us and around our family um, there was money that was raised as a result of all this, um, basically like through a GoFundMe situation. And we kind of found ourselves sitting there with 
all this money and and not really knowing what to do with it. And so we kind of collectively as a family said we can't just keep this. Like we have to do something with it. We have to use it to honor Tommy's memory, but also keep his spirit alive. So I always like talk about how the fact like anyone that has children knows like they all have like their own unique thing that kind of gives mm -hmm. them it's like their own little superpower, right? Yeah. Well, Tommy's superpower was he had this innate ability to just see people where they were, and he didn't care if they were popular, not popular, tall, small. He like he just didn't care. So he would do things like Nikki was telling me like he would like bake a cake and bring it to someone at school, and we didn't even know who the people were. But he's like, well, I found out in math class it's her birthday, and so I just made her a cake, and he didn't even know her. Like they weren't even <laughs> friends at his. And he had this, he just saw people. There's another story where he was at a party and this girl, he could tell was starting to get really anxious. And he didn't know her, but he could just see her. And so he went up to her and said, hey, do you want to go jump on the trampoline? And she was like, yes. And then we heard this story after, like from her mom, that like he really saved her in that moment. And so we developed the Be Like Tommy Project to keep that joy and that spirit and that energy alive and to just keep doing that for other people in whatever way we can. So the mission of the Be Like Tommy Project is to care for the hearts of others, both physically and emotionally. And so the physical part's very easy, it's very tangible. We donate AED devices. We've given a number of AED devices to the high school. And we're actually, I'll talk briefly about this event that we're doing uh, in a couple of weeks, where we're actually giving an AED. Jeff Peterson, the athletic director, came up to me and said, I'd love it if every team we have could travel with an AED device. So we're going to donate 10 AED devices to the high school so that every team has one when they travel. And then as you all know, they're doing a big addition on the high school with the new stadium. When that's completed, we're also going to install an outdoor AED device that's temperature controlled. It'll be there 24-7 and accessible. Um, and those are a little more expensive because obviously you have to, there's a lot of security things that go into it temperature-wise. So. The proceeds of this upcoming event that we're doing called Tommy's Olympic Speedwalk are going to go towards that. Um, so that's the physical side. The emotional side is just how can we help people in the community, right? So we did this big thing over the holidays last year called Tommy's Trees. We raised $15,000 through a match that we got, $15,000 that we donated to WeCan over the holidays. Um, that's an initiative that will keep going. I'm really hoping that we can like find a better cost structure so we can really blow it up. But it's a good start, right? So, so there's that. And then we're also working on some other programming to help with really just spread that message of kindness to other kids and the real kind of impact and power that small acts of kindness can have and teaching it to them in a, in a, in a way that's really tangible, right? So anyway, so to the event that's coming up. So... Tommy had this thing, he was a super like unique, funny, I mean, part of what his ability to bring joy was the fact he was just funny, like he made people laugh. He got out of bed every morning and all he cared about was just making everyone that he came in contact with smile and laugh. And he started this thing where he told us like, mom and dad, I'm gonna be like an Olympic speed <laughs> And I was like, I don't even, he's like, no, if you get this time, you can do it. So everywhere we'd go, he'd like be doing this walking thing. <laughs> Yeah. And I swear he just did it to embarrass us, but he thought it was great. <laughs> and so after he passed, we were like, we, we need to do an event to not only celebrate him, but celebrate that unique spirit he had and then raise money for the foundation. And so this will be our third year of Tommy's Olympic Speed Walk. And it's really not much of a walk. I mean, we start at the high school. We go past his gravesite. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's right in the corner, um, <clears throat> right there um, by Game Farm Road. It had a Christmas tree on it for almost three years, so you really couldn't miss it. Um, so we always stop there. We drop some flowers in the in the fence line, and then we go back to the school, and then we, it's just a party. So we've got bouncy houses and face painting and crazy hair and tattoos and all this just really fun stuff for kids. Um, this year we actually are having a mascot speed walk. So Crunch from the Timberwolves will be there. Oh, nice. Goldie from the Gophers will be there. Madonna from the St. Paul Saints will be there, and not only will they like take pictures and sign autographs, but they're also going to compete in oh, the first fun. ever mascot 
race walk. <laughs> nice, nice. So we're excited for that. So that's June 15th. It starts at 9 in the morning, and I don't know, it'll probably go till 1130. It's really just, it's a quick, fun morning, and, you know, it's done by noon, and everyone can get back to their summer activities. So Yeah, it's a fun event, and um, it's one of our biggest fundraisers as well, so we're trying to get those numbers up. Yeah. And so we have flyers for those if anyone wants to grab them. Yeah, if away. you want to yeah. hand, hand them, them out. out. Yeah. And then um, the other event that we always do is we do a golden gala in the fall. Oh. So if you're interested, BeLikeTommy.org is our website. We always post all the events on BeLikeTommy.org and then all of kind of Thank what you. we're doing with the money we raise and uh, yeah, other work that we're doing in the community. So. Thank you all for your time. Yeah, you guys are doing the, the trees fundraiser this fall too again we'll do the Tommy's trees again for sure mm -hmm. after the golden gala mm -hmm. yeah That's, okay it kind of runs in parallel just because of the timing we like to do the gala the week before Thanksgiving because then all the kids that left for college can come because they're all back for Thanksgiving so they can all attend and then the Tommy's trees thing just happens right on top of it but cool. last year we sold over 500 trees and yeah like I said <laughs> and we deliver those ourselves and um, so we're gonna find a way to make that a little more scalable. But. Where do you where do you sign up for that to get the It's piece? right on the right on the website. Okay. Um, and we'll do all the promotions through all the social medias and yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a fun one. That's a giving campaign for us. We don't make any money on that. So yeah. pretty much for every tree that we sold, it covered our cost and then we gave another ten dollars and then the ten dollars got matched by um, a couple other donors, and that's what allowed us to raise the 15000 So, yeah, that'd be fun to double that this year, too. And I love just seeing, we love seeing all the little trees all over the town. And, yeah, we were delivering them to Woodbury and New Brighton, and mm -hmm. they were all over the Twin Cities this year. So, so yeah. Does Council have any other questions or comments? Yeah. I don't think so. Well, thank you guys for coming yeah. out. And no, appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having us. All right, thanks. Thanks. All right, number seven, we got the council introduction, presentation and concept plan from Carl Runk and Jim Gooley, the development of <coughs> properties at 2400 to, and 2420 Commerce Boulevard. Boulevard. We got Rita here. I'm just going to do my brief introduction. Okay, very, thanks. very brief. Um, as you all know, but for the members of the audience, uh, I'm Rita Trapp, the city's planning consultant. Just going to do a brief introduction and then have the applicants themselves come forward. Um, city policy number 12 uh, requires or uh, property owners that are interested in having a concept subdivision be reviewed by the council or asked to come and make an introduction at the beginning uh, before they go through the work of doing a preliminary plat or a final plat. Um, so tonight we have one of those requests for you this evening. It's for the properties at 2400 and 2420 Commerce Boulevard. Uh, the applicants are proposing a three building, four unit um, in each building, so a total of 12 units on the east side of Commerce. Um, with frontage on Lost Lake, um, it's uh, page. Oh, I was going to say, it's up on your up on the screen as well. Um, the purpose of this introduction is to make sure that the council, as well as the community, has an opportunity to learn about what an applicant is proposing, to ask questions, maybe provide some clarification. Um, council also has the opportunity to suggest some refinements or things that might match kind of the city's vision for the future. Um, staff did distribute uh, information about tonight's meeting to property owners within 350 feet of the proposed project, so there may be neighbors in attendance as well. And as you're aware, usually neighbors are able to speak on the matter. Um, however, there's no action being requested this evening. Um, staff has not reviewed it uh, because that's not part of the policy. At this point, we're just here to share the information and have you have a chance to take a peek at it. So with that, I'll sit down and um, the applicants can come forward and present. Uh, their information. All right, thank you. Uh, Carl and Jim, you want to? Can you just give us your name and address? <laughs> Great, thanks, Rita. Uh, mayor, council, staff, thank you. Yep. My name is Jim Gooley. I live at uh, 5496 Lost Lake Lane, right here in Mound. 
fact, just walked up to the meeting. It's that <laughs> convenient. Uh, part of our project is really uh, involves the walkability of Mound and the importance of that. This 12-unit, uh, it's a townhome style condominium, and we can go into detail as to why that ended up being in that configuration. Uh, but these will be owner-occupied just, just to the east of Our Lady of the Lake Church and um, right on Lost Lake, right in that sort of what I would say narrow strip uh, of land there that's been owned by the Falness family for decades. So we've worked with them uh, pretty much over the past nine months to really realize the dream that Russ Falness had for this property. He did really, uh, when they lived there and then moved, you know, had the idea of townhomes for this property. So the family's supportive and very interested to see this move forward. Um, I should also tell you that I've met with the leadership at the church and they're very supportive of this project. Um, I've been in, I would say, I don't know, six months plus discussions with the uh, attorney for the property to the north, the Lang property, to see if that could be something we could acquire and combine with this. At this point, those conversations are ongoing and our plan does not include that at this time, uh, but is a consideration in the future. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, development team. Carl Runk uh, joins me tonight with um, just an incredible amount of experience, formerly with Ryan Companies, great deal of condominium experience, multifamily experience, so lucky to have him on the team. Uh, Dan Schaefer is also here, who is representing our builder and has done a number of projects around the lake, just highest quality and uh, best practices. Tim Winton is our uh, architect who's done projects, again, all around the lake community, Wyzetta, and excited to have him on board. He'll go through some of the plans specifically. Um, we have Matt Pavick, who is not here, but he's with Civil Slight Group. He's our civil engineer who was most recently involved in the Artessa project, so very familiar with Mound, the, the regulations here and whatever, so working closely with them. I should also mention that you know, over the past nine months, we have met, uh, I can't even count the number of meetings with the LMCD, the Watershed District, the DNR, to make sure that we're doing this in uh, the best way possible for Lost Lake, for the community. Um, we are looking at a, an extensive uh, stormwater treatment plan that would be above what is um, currently required. So we feel strongly about not having that same, you know, direct connection from commerce into the lake. We'll treat that and uh, create a much better environment. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carl and our team to continue the presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask at any time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Can you give us your name and address? Sure. And, uh, and Mr. Mayor, members of the council and staff, I'm Carl Runk. Address is uh, 441 Second Street in Excelsior. Um, we look forward to your feedback in this introduction uh, format, uh, being the first time uh, we've seen um, the council here, the mayor, about this project. Um, if you could turn to the slide regarding um, this overall snapshot, but also the next page here on the 2040 plan. We went into great care on understanding the the Mound 2040 plan that you established in the amendments to it that were just approved a few months ago, mm -hmm. and how this stretch of Commerce Boulevard fits into that, being, like Jim said, very desirable and walkable, uh, but also how can we contribute to the life cycle housing in Mound? Um, mm -hmm. There's a demand that's higher now than ever in Mound and other cities like Mound for um, people looking to downsize into maintenance-free living, and this is a great site for that in our minds, being an HOA maintained condominiums that you could walk to downtown Mound, uh, restaurants and shops and Dakota, the Dakota Trail. So we, we really feel like we've hit on what the comp plan calls for specific to mixed use developments at this stretch of commerce with mid use, medium density. <clears throat> and specifically what Tim Witten will talk about with the architecture, that the architecture really uh, adheres to the character you're looking for in downtown Mound as well as an extension of downtown Mound with pitch roofs, walk-up units, um, and just overall desirability to contribute to this part of Mound. 
Um, so I'll, I'll turn it to Tim to talk about it. look forward to your questions and comments. All right, can you give us your name and address? Good evening, uh, Tim Witten, Witten Associates, uh, architects uh, in Minnetonka. Uh, good to be here today. Uh, if you could pull up the site plan. Uh, go down one more, I think. Can dim some of the lights? Right, keep going. Oh, Jesse. Keep going. Can you get the light down? There's now a couple more. Just minutes. dim it a little bit, yeah. the lights. I don't know. It's just a little bright. Uh, the, Is there a, the do I have a mouse? Or anything? Do you want a yep. laser? Will this work? This is a laser. Oh. Or the yellow button. Okay. Did you want more? <clears throat> That's good. So Is that good? I can move the page now? No. Oh, okay. Just the, just yeah, the button. Just the, All right. Perfect. That's Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. A couple more pages to the site plan. <clears throat> One more, I think. There we go. That's great. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the site is quite narrow. And uh, first thing we look at uh, when we design is try to figure out the parking. And with really less than 60 feet in depth, that means we can't do double loaded structured parking. So it's single loaded. So that tells us uh, that we have some limitations. We also made a commitment as a team that we we're going to have two parking spaces enclosed for every unit. Yeah. Um, that was an absolute given. We started looking at townhomes, conventional row homes, but as the uh, as we lined them up, they were all connected, and it it didn't work particularly well with the parking. The parking was going to make it be a condo anyway because it's common. And so we went from that and, and studied a little bit further and found that uh, with two stories of townhomes, living space, we didn't really have enough on the main floor, and we had really too much on the top floor. And so it wasn't really satisfying the market, that, uh, the target. So it didn't take us too long to kind of say, let's look at this a little bit differently and look at it as, as separate buildings. And so we have three separate buildings that are four units in each building. And so there would be the row of parking here, and on the lowest level, it's a um, slope site, kind of like a, a reverse tuck under condition. So it's low here, high here. So our really a garage is below grade. And then we have, on the, at grade level, we have two flats, and then we have two flats above that. And so we really have a common entrance. Um, and so as we come in from the street, we come down, we enter into the structured parking. We actually continue here and have an enclosed space where we connect to the next um, parking space. Uh, so with the flats, um, it was pretty much taking care of our, our, um, our design issues and designing to empty nesters and downsizing as you had a category in your 2040. So if we could move up to the next slide. Oh, uh, the other way. Uh, Pat, yeah, there you go. So this gives you just kind of a concept of what we're looking for <laughs> here. So this is actually a four-unit building. And this is the parking I uh, described, where we have two parking spaces for every, every flat. What's good about this compared to the townhomes, the townhomes, we had to have an individual elevator for every unit. We had to have an individual stair for every unit. We were taking away precious space in the parking and precious space within the units themselves by doing that, by having just one common elevator and the stair uh, allowed us more room. In this particular design, we have, it's a 20 foot wide by 22 foot deep garage. It's really our townhome standard. And then we also have storage space. So it's, it's an ideal situation um, as far as uh, you know, this particular buyer. So this is an example of one of the flats. And every one of them has um, an owner suite, uh, a guest bedroom, a den, and of course your kitchen, living, dining, uh, living, everything's on, on one level. And this particular plan is about 2,000 uh, square feet. And, uh, and so the next unit over might be a little different size, could be a little smaller, could be a little bigger. And this is the common entrance uh, for that, uh, for all four of them. And then we even have a stair connecting because they have a a terrace for each, a private terrace for each unit. 
stair connecting that can go right down um, to the boardwalk that eventually gets them to the, um, to the docks. Uh, if we move up one more slide, thank you, very good. Um, so this would be the view from Commerce, and so it really appears like a two-story structure. And this is the common entrance, but we're also offering entrances to each of the first level plans. So in a sense, it looks similar to a raw home and actually acts similar to a raw home. Um, it's just that they happen to be uh, flats. Our exteriors are really a timeless design. Uh, we work together as a team for this. It's kind of a modern tutor. Um, so it's kind of a cross between contemporary and, and traditional. It's got uh, quality materials of stucco, and we have panels, whether that's going to be a hardy uh, type product, uh, maybe some cut stone um, at the base. This would be the view from the lake, uh, Lost Lake. And so we have no view of garages from Commerce, and we have no view um, actually it's covered, and we put windows down here so you don't see it from the lake as well, right. all enclosed. So this would be a flat right here, a typical unit, another one above, and same thing, same thing here. And so they would have private terraces in each case, common um, access to um, a stairway that gets them down to the boardwalk. And with that, I think I'm uh, happy to answer any questions also, just and, you know, get your feedback, but go ahead. I just had a question if you can clarify, um, it was a few slides back, but like what the single loaded versus double loaded parking meant. Yeah, so if you go here. What yeah, the difference it, it, was. No, there. you gotta, gotta move down to parking. Uh, stop right there, please. Up, oh, there we go. So in a typical, say, apartment, <coughs> we would have parking on one side, drive aisle, and a parking on another side. And we need 66 feet minimum to be able to do that. We don't have close to that much depth on this site. And so that just tells us right away, we can only do so many units. We all have to have two car garages and we're pretty much set with that single load of condition. Okay. So, um, and uh, look forward to your comments. Yeah, do you have any, um, all right. is that, uh, is there any parking for visitors anywhere? Is that where you drive in? Is that a couple spots there? I'm sorry, say again? I'm just wondering if you have any parking. Is that when you drive into the units, is there a spot for visitor parking? Yeah, so kind? we do have two spots right here. And as this plan evolves, we're going to probably have some smaller units. And in that case, we might be able to, to add some. And then along with the parking along Commerce, uh, I think we're probably OK. So it's just your overnight parking. Yeah. And there may be a situation we've done in the past too where a lot of these folks that live here don't really only have one car because it's a second home or a third home. And so they can allow their guests to come into the structured parking and, and take one of the spots. And we just have to work through that with security. You guys were going to, they were going to have uh, like common dock access too, I believe. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, if, we, read it, but. if we blow up, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll let you answer that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, as it showed in, on this plan, there's existing open water on the northern side that adjoins with the property owner of the building there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we have an agreement with that individual to have common dock mm -hmm. access. Um, and we would then improve the current. There's just a seawall there today with some uh, older docks in disrepair. We would work with him uh, to manage it with our HOA and upgrade the docks that way. Cool. But this would be um, what's shown here anyway, we've previewed with the LMCD uh, regarding a boardwalk that's similar to other boardwalks that have been done around, around the lake. And, and they're, they're uh, willing to go with that LMCD? The LMCD, yeah, we're, we're too early to make a formal application yet, but in preliminary application mm -hmm. talks with the LMCD and the, the water, watershed district and the DNR that we're not, we're not trying to um, apply for a dredging permit you know, as far as a brand new area of docks. It's really taking advantage of existing water that is here already. Okay. Since he's up here, does council have any other questions for him? I don't think so. Well, I, no, think, you, really I nice. think they're beautiful. You know, we've been really spoiled all these years that the fallness property has been undeveloped. 
as we turn the bend and see the nice green space. So, you know, I'd rather see two, so it's not a wall of condos there, but I'm assuming that probably wouldn't be very profitable for you to just have two sets of eight rather than three. We were trying to look at height as well in your comp plan guidance with two stories we right. preferred or, you know, versus going higher in that case. The, you know, it's economics, of course, in terms of uh, the site in that case. Yeah, it's nice that they're broken up though. I mean, it's yeah. like the three separate buildings I think is appealing. Mm -hmm. And then you guys mentioned, I couldn't remember the exact name of the materials, but you know, it sounded like they were going to be like, yeah, some above what would be required, or, you yeah, know. Stucco and yeah. stone, and uh, you know, we're still in the early concept phase yet, but that's, that, that's a quality is definitely um, gonna be top notch what we're proposing with it. Cool. And these will be owner occupied for sale. Yes, yeah. for sale. So we're not no rentals um, and top notch, high quality <clears throat> on the lake. I mean, this is exactly what we're looking for. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to express a little concern about the visitor parking, though, because right now the east side of the street is no parking. And so the parking on Commerce is on the west side, which would be the church's side. <clears throat> but you're talking to them, so that's good. Um, and um, and also, you know, we're trying to approach the county on extending what's now the Andrews Sisters Trail so that it totally encircles the entire Lost Lake so that it would go down Wilshire and Bartlett and come back on Commerce. So it would come right in front of your development, which would be great. I mean, it fits with what you're doing around the walkability and stuff. So that, that would just be. Yeah, anything to enhance walkability further for the downtown area is right. a positive yeah. in our view. Mm -hmm. right? That might play in nice with like the way that they would get to a dock anyway. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in visitor parking, uh, Tim alluded to it, but there there is opportunities, we think, within the mm -hmm. structure underneath you. You can't see here. Um, even this space right here. There's a dry mile underneath right here to connect these two. OK. There's space in there. We just need to evolve the plans more to show visitor parking that could fit there as well. The other thing, there is parking on the street. Yeah, it's, it's on but the it's one side. west side. On the east side, there's no parking. Every time I go to church, I see the other people going to their church on the right side, right in front of Williamson. I think it's just 7 to 9 and 4 to 6. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Monday so there's Friday. limited parking. Limited parking that comes on the east side. You can park there sometimes. Sometimes. Only when you go to church. Because that was one of the problems with the Williams site. And then you've got two docks available for homeowners. <clears throat> one per homeowner is our target with that. Yeah. So you're going to have a total of eight docks down there? That's, well, uh, 12 is our or 12. objective, yes. Yeah. And LMCD, because it's 900 feet of shoreline on the Fonald's property, it's one per 50 feet with their rules. Mm -hmm. So that's how we came up with the, the numbers in that way. Mm -hmm. And a shared arrangement with the neighboring property owner. So this is a concept plan. This is our opportunity to give feedback. We, I mean, we talked about parking. That's one thing. I feel like usually we give feedback about, you know, maybe wanting some nicer building material and stuff like that. But this looks. Yeah. I mean, I saw like the reference for the other projects they've done in the West mm -hmm. Metro too, and like I mean, it seems like it's kind of what we're what we were wanting. High level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when we come back with a form application, we'll include you know, samples. I'm sure that that's a requirement. Samples of like what the materials would look like more, so you can see here. Um, with with the look of it, I would just say, you know, think of Lake Minnetonka, maybe not too nautically, but you know, just kind of remember that in the back of your head. Um, nothing wrong with the current look, but I'm just saying, just remember that. Yeah, that we're around. We're yeah. We're providing access to Lake Minnetonka. And yeah. It's a community on Lake Minnetonka. Right. And I think this will play in nicely to, you know, our tests around the corner and maybe potential other things that we do. Down the I mean, it's, well, so. it's, it's building a neighborhood downtown, right. you know, because we had the villas, Artessa, um, the Aneski's building, and now this. I mean, it, it creates a nice neighborhood that's cohesive, that you all have a theme around walkability and access to downtown. Plus, we're going to do the new city park in that area, too. So, 
Yeah, yeah, I think it, the business owners, we would think, would be supportive of more people living in mm -hmm. close proximity that way. Yeah. yeah. Any last questions? No? Well, again, thank you for taking your time, energy, resources uh, to you know, build up our town. We appreciate it. I know this is a concept. You still got to go through planning and all the different yeah. steps, and, but we appreciate everything you've done yeah. to get this far, at least. So. Thanks for the feedback. Yep. Thank you. See you next time. Thank right. you. Oh, uh, we're going to do public, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just done with him. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll open it to a public comment if anybody wants to give their opinion on it. I have a question. Yeah, you just come up. Just come up and give us your uh, name and address. Uh, I'm Sherry Buescher at 2544 North Saunders Lake Drive. I'm curious, I may have missed something at a different yeah. meeting, but have we ever talked about retail underneath, living above, so we have more shops? Not for this property per se. It probably just maybe downtown um, Artessa that just never worked out that was somewhat before a lot of us um, potentially in the future yes the, the problem with development as a whole is there's different property owners that own different things so like if you look at the other side of the street of commerce um, you know you you, you got to either get a developer or you got to get the city or you know, group people together to kind of buy out properties and come in with a plan and then do that. Um, our test, I think, was more just a, a dollar amount thing that just worked out for them. I, I do think that that would be something in the future. And we have talked about that with other plans with, there was an apartment proposal by Wells Fargo that mm -hmm. didn't work, didn't go through. But that, um, I think the original plan had apartments. <laughs> The or, original uh, retail re original redevelopment plan yeah. was to have that, but it, it is not necessarily. It's not easy to do mixed use development, and you've got to have the right kind of scale, and the market. And I think one of the things we have to think about in Mound is, if we have mixed use um, downtown, it may not be retail. It may be commercial uses like service business businesses or other types of businesses, but we're not really a, a retail downtown. I don't so I, that, I'd that's the other be. thing. We could be, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we could be. Because <laughs> yeah, I feel be. like we go to Excelsior and Wyzetta and other towns yeah, to do our look, shopping. They're both overbuilt, too, <laughs> with commercial. <laughs> and it depends on what, you know, developers want to develop, yeah. too. I mean, they all have different pricing, but it's like it could be retail, commercial, or office. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of a mix. Yeah. Okay. You got to get everybody on board. It's, it's <laughs> then you got to get all of us and planning, and it's a challenge. But um, I, th I think we're all open to it. We just have to have, you know, a developer or someone come up and give us an idea. The right okay. building, um, or the city mm -hmm. has to out outsource and, and come and do that. A lot of times, it's by the city doing that, you have to give them some. Okay. And in the past councils, we've not been willing to do that. We actually, way past councils, they bought up a whole town. <laughs> And then we just sat on it and do anything with it. So we're a little timid to do that again, to buy yeah. stuff, waiting for someone. I w I'd rather have, you know, if, I don't know if we're getting recorded tonight or not, but uh, if, if anybody's hearing this, we're, we're open for, oh, now he turns the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> the light wasn't on all the time, and I was like, eh. That was my note. I was like, oh, our attorney's not here. So, um, But yeah, I mean, we're open for business in Mount, so we want, we want more of all this. Okay. That's what I hear. So, thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for the comment. Thanks. Any other comments? All right, I'm going to close that. Um, do you want to do any recap or anything, Rita? Or are we good? I think we're good. We're good. So, what's the next step for them then? <coughs> well, whatever. Yes. Recap or next step. Or okay. Um. So the council introduction is intended to provide an opportunity for you and the public to see. So the applicant's next step will be likely to prepare the types of uh, applications that they would need. So typically um, preliminary plat to kind of create that type of a structure and that would go through both planning commission and council at the time that they're ready to do that. And then as you heard, they referenced a whole bunch of other agencies that also have to be involved. Um, so obviously there will be continued coordination between the applicants and all those agencies on who comes first um, and trying to review the various approvals that they would need for the process. Cool. All right. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming out, guys. All right, number eight, we got planning commission recommendation. Uh, a is consideration slash action. Proposed two minor, two lot minor subdivision at property 5123 Waterbury Road. And Rita has this one too. See if they keep talking or I don't know if I'm going to grab the door. <laughs> Thanks. Interesting. That's the first time that's ever happened. There we go. Okay. All right. Good evening again. Uh, the application before you is a two lot minor subdivision on Waterbury Road, as you referenced. Uh, the project is located on the east end of uh, Waterbury Road by Tuxedo Boulevard. Um, currently, there is a single family home on that property, um, and that, prop that home was constructed in about 1930 um, and is in need re of repair. The applicant plans to demolish that home and construct two new single family homes as a result of this subdivision. Um, this one has a little bit more um, natural features on a site. There is a bluff um, condition. Uh, on the west side of the site, I know it says east, I guess I didn't fix that. On the east side, of, on the west side of the site, and there are wetlands both to the south and east of the property. Um, it is a two lot minor subdivision. They are proposing to create two parcels. One parcel will be 11,000 square feet in size, and the other one will be 33,000 square feet in size. Um, the intended use for both parcels is construction of a new single family home. Um, the applicant is um, meeting the criteria of a minor subdivision for everyone's benefit. The city has major and minor subdivision. A major subdivision involves a two-step process of preliminary plat and final plat. A minor subdivision allows you to just come once um, through the process and have your plat um, done concurrently. Uh, the reason that they can do that is that they have frontage on an existing public road and they don't require the construction of any new public facilities, public street, um, and they do meet uh, the intents as described in the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance. Um, the area is guided for low density residential, so the two single family homes uh, will be in keeping with that guidance. Uh, the zoning is R1A. Uh, they are considered a lot of record today. As a result of a subdivision, you always change from a lot of record to a non-lot of record, so they will be held to a higher standard relative to setbacks and impervious surface. Um, as far as the applicant has provided, it seems like they will be able to meet those standards without an issue, so we don't anticipate, and the applicant has not requested any variances. So they are able to construct the project that they would like uh, just through the subdivision process. Uh, as I referenced, there is a wetland, and the applicant does show a wetland setback um, on both parcels. They're well away from that. Um, the applicant, in the terms of showing the proposed house, there were in the plans a proposed house where it would be located and what it might look like. Um, those are not um, for sure uh, plans. Those are kind of what the developer is estimating, what they might show to a potential buyer. If they show something different, they will need to come um, and revise the plans, and those are the plans that we would review at building permit time. Any, uh, any application um, approval tonight only has to do with the subdivision, so the creation of the two lots. You're not approving the actual house, anything along those lines. That'll come through the building permit process. And if at that time they decide they can't meet any of the requirements of the code, they'd have to come back through and have a variance request uh, at that time. There is also a bluff, and I've shown it kind of circled in red. Uh, the applicant should be able to meet the 10-foot top of bluff setback for the structure. They are close, but staff is well aware of amount of dealing with that, so we'll just monitor that uh, as we move through the process. We did distribute uh, the application materials for public and staff agency review as we customarily do. Um, the only person that really had any comments was the city engineer who's here today, if you have questions. Um, and they just uh, referenced the need for erosion control planning. Um, so a kind of customary language that we would anticipate. Uh, we did notify neighbors within 350 feet of the property. Uh, they were notified both of the Planning Commission and the City Council meetings. Actually, we do not have a public hearing, so we don't have an official notice public hearing, but we do notify. Um, and app, uh, neighbors did speak at the Planning Commission meeting, and they may be here today as well to speak. Uh, the concerns, as we referenced in the packet, a lot of them had to do with the fact that it is a very narrow street, and so it's hard even today to move on the street, backing out of your driveway. There's uh, people that are parked on that. 
Um, we are adding one additional house at the end of the street, so it is of a concern for those neighbors. Uh, emergency vehicle access, there was references to blocking of views, uh, construction traffic, and property values. Some of the similar things that we've heard with other projects in Mound. Um, the Planning Commission did consider this at their May 7th meeting and did have a good conversation with the public. Uh, kind of the, con the consensus of the Planning Commission uh, was recognizing that narrow streets, particularly on the island, is very common, and that's just something that people have to deal with. We're adding one additional house. We're not adding a lot of additional. Um, the applicant had um, included multi-car garage, space in the driveway. They've done what they can to accommodate parking off street, but the reality is when someone builds um, and someone moves in, there is that uh, element that will have to be addressed. Um, it was also noted at the meeting that the house currently is non-conforming, so any new construction, if that house was taken down and rebuilt, um, and they met the new standards, they would probably be blocking views. And as a reminder, we do not have a view standard in our code, so that's not something that we can really um, prevent, is where people construct. Ultimately, the Planning Commission did a unanimous recommendation of approval for the subdivision. Um, so this evening, as I said, the applicant is here. There may be neighbors that would like to speak again. That's of your purview. Um, we do have a, mo a resolution in your packet since the Planning Commission and staff both recommended approval. Um, we do want to note um, the applicant has requested and they can provide a little more information, um, but they had asked that the trunk water and sewer charges be paid at the time of building permit rather than the release of the resolution. That is something that we have done from time to time, but it would may mean we need to make a slight change to the resolution that we drafted for you. Um, it's around condition number 16. <coughs> Uh, so that's something for you to consider and the applicant can provide a little bit more context to that. That was something that um, was forwarded to me uh, to make a change. Uh, if you don't want to make a motion, obviously your other two options are to make a motion of denial. Um, we would want some direction to have staff to prepare that with findings of fact on why we would deny it. Uh, or if there's more information that you need, if you want to table a request, we can certainly work with the applicant to provide additional information. So with that, I can answer any of the questions if I didn't cover anything in the depth that you need. Does council have any questions for Rita? What is more typical, like the paying the trunk charges at? The typical is what or? we normally do, which is that at the release of the resolution, that's when you would pay those trunk fees. Yeah. Um, but we have considered it at times for smaller types of subdivisions like okay. this. I mean, it sounds so. like something that's pretty minor. It's not like precedent setting or anything like that. No. Okay. Typically, we start with that because especially if you're going to do um, a large subdivision, you want it done and record it and write it. But sometimes when we have these smaller ones, um, that is something that's taken into consideration. How much are trunk fees typically? Is it 240 or something? Uh, 2,000 a piece. Oh, oh a sewer. OK. Okay, any other questions? All right. Okay. And then, applicant, you want to come up? Yeah. All right, just give us your name and address. My name is Michael Greer and my wife, Michelle Greer. We live at 2835 Highland Road in Minnetrista. <laughs> We've been there for 30 years. Um, I think at the introduction, you know, which was on the 28th of February, I filled you in on some of my background. Yep. Um, our children both went to Mound. We, we're, we consider ourselves Mound residents. We just do. That's the way it is. Uh, anyways, we're excited about it, and we thank you folks for your time, and we thank what the Planning Commission and, and the Mound's planning staff has done. I think they've done a really good job, the consultant, Rita, for setting the table as to what we're looking to do with the property. Um, we're excited about it. We feel that it's it's the right project for our size company. This is what I do. I've done this for a number of years. Uh, single family, what I call infill lots. I look for a nice piece of property like this. Sometimes it can be subdivided. Sometimes not. You know, and um, <clears throat> I specialize pretty much in doing single family homes in existing neighborhoods because I'm not a big builder. I don't do track homes. And so when I saw this piece of property up for sale, I went and looked at it and fell in love with it because I think it's a beautiful piece of property. And I thought it's something that I could work with and do a, a nice job with. Um, so, you know, basically we've done uh, what's needed for the administrative side of it. We made formal application for the subdivision. We had the hearing with the planning commission, as you know. Rita just went through that. 
Uh, basically, we're ready to go. Um, the plans, just to clarify, and Rita said this correctly, we just wanted to clarify that th those plans were drawn specifically for this project. I had my draftsman draw it. They fit the setback requirements. They work well with the topography. And they may well be what's built, because I am going to put them on the market. I'm not going to build a spec home, for instance. I'll, I'll go ahead now, and if we get approval, and I will market the homes um, individually, but with the homes that I've designed for each lot, parcel A and B. And if the buyer wants that home, then I'll just move ahead with that. But if a buyer comes in and says, you know what, this is really nice, Mike, but it's not quite what our family needs, then I'll just go ahead and draw with my draftsman a, a custom home for them. Yeah. So, you know, it may well be this plan, but it may not. That's the only thing I just wanted to clarify that. But it'll be something similar, you know. It may not be the exact home, obviously. Um, really, you know, we've agreed with all the recommendations that are laid out in the uh, approval recommendations that the planning uh, department has put together and the consultant. Uh, with the only one request we had was number 16, and that's not a deal breaker. It's just that I'm used to having the sewer and water charges all in on the permit part when I go to pay for the permit. It's usually the water and sewer charges. If I bought a lot from, let's say it's a developed lot, those are all fall under the permitting part. It's not a deal breaker for us, but I just like to put it into that. It's 2,000 each lot. It, it does, it's not a deal breaker, but I just thought I would defer that and pay that with the permit when we do the permit part. Um, other than that, you know, all the recommendations, we have no problem with it. Um, we have had some concerns from the neighbors. You know, we had that when we did our first introduction. I take all those concerns seriously. Uh, I've been building for a long time, and I built on dead end roads in the past. I've built on cul-de-sacs. I've built on open lots. I've built I, on South Minneapolis. I built on a city lot where we demoed a house, and it was five foot setbacks on either side, where we literally had to haul the fill off site while we put the foundation in, and then bring the fill back in afterwards. So, you know, I'm used to tight sites. I've worked on tight sites in the past. I have experience with that and demolition in the past. Um, I understand the neighbor's concern. But my, you know, I guess rebuttal to that is I've grown up in this community. I grew up in Excelsior. I've done remodeling new homes all over the Lake Minnetonka area. And dead-end roads are not uncommon. It's because of the lake. I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of little peninsulas and bays, and that's what's created these dead ends that we have. And um, I know it's a dead-end road. I knew that when I went and looked at the property. So I had put together an action plan for how I'm going to deal with that during the construction phase, you know, and I've laid that out on my letter. It's an open letter to the city. If you take a look at an April 3rd letter that I, I sent out, and basically, you just have to be proactive when you're building on a dead end road. I'm going to make sure all my subcontractors know that it's a dead end road. I'm going to put up signage about it being a dead end road. We're going to build a temporary. I guess I've had a little pointer again. I think. Maybe it's up here. Oh, that's up here. Sorry about that. It's a yellow button. The yellow button? Yeah. Right. So basically, when, when we get started, we would demo the existing house. And then I would do, uh, bring in some fill right here in the front where the driveway is right now and make a parking landing area mm -hmm. so that I can have lumber delivered, I can have a dumpster delivered, I can have the people turn around in that area too, and it'll be clear signage for that. So that's the intent of making uh, an area here in front, a landing area, I call it. I may do another one where this driveway is going to come in too, so that we'll have some room to have materials, to have people turn around, to have a dumpster. And so, you know, I have a provision for that. Uh, I know the neighbor, Mike Worth, across the street had a concern about being able to back out of his house. His driveway is right here. But the driveway is offset. So, you know, I did that by design because I believe that he has enough room to back out of his driveway and turn and go back down Waterbury. I measured the street, and the street measures 26 foot 6, curb to curb. An average car is about 6.5 feet per the DOT uh, website, web, web page. And so that would give you 20 feet to back up without even hitting into a car. That It would be, let's say this family here in the parcel B had 
a neighbor or a friend over or holiday. That would mice, there could very well be a car park there, but that still gives you 20 feet to back out of your driveway, turn and go you know, west out of, out of Waterbury. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out that you know, I've taken all their concerns into consideration. I understand it's a dead end and I understand they have parking concerns. However, I feel that the road really isn't any narrow. I went and measured some other roads in the area there, right out in that particular area. And they all measured consistently about the same width. And so I, I've sent the photo over. I don't know if you had time to download oh, that. but I had a couple pictures. Yeah. Not, I don't think those are yours. Those yeah. Are mine. All right. <laughs> They're right here. This is a good one. And so right here, I'm standing in front of our property looking west down Waterbury. And this is on a, on a typical day. I came there in an afternoon last week. And one of the residents, I believe they're in uh, 5129, Zach works from home. And that's the only car that was out on the street. And when you look now to the west, down at the bottom of the hill there is where Tuxedo is. But the road is the same width all the way across Tuxedo. And then it continues on west till it gets to the lake. And there's another dead end on the opposite side, I believe, of, uh, I forget the name of that road. But Anyways, um, what I'm getting at is that there is a, it is a, a dead end, I recognize that, but I want to you know, reiterate to people that it is just adding one new residence. There's already been a home on that property for, well, close to 100 years. It was built in 1930. And we are adding one new resident. We is two new homes, but one has been there for almost 100 years. Um, Anyway, the other thing I want to point out is too, Rita, if you could put up my little sketch. I'm not the best <laughs> drawing uh, the draftsman here. It's a little, it's yeah, a, like a yeah. legal notepad yeah. one. Yeah. I just wanted to point this out for everybody. Um, that's kind of my little drawing of all the neighborhood addresses there. And there are the two proposed uh, lot A and, and lot B here. Those would be the proposed new home. Both of those have three car garages. Plus, they'll have adequate driveways for people to park on a driveway, too. So I don't think we're adding, we're trying not to add any more cars parked on the road, on Waterbury, other than occasionally on a holiday. The other residents, with all with the exception of, of Zach and Amanda here, um, they do not have a garage. They do have a double deep driveway. So in the, from November to April, when you can park overnight, they park double deep in their driveway. So I believe out of convenience, they don't do that in the summertime because one has to back up to let the other one in and out. It's kind of a, a hassle factor for them. But the other residents all have driveways and two car garages. So, you know, which is typical. And so in my opinion, they have come in and, and have complained and that's fine. I have no problem with people raising concerns. They, they live there, I get that. Here, you know, here comes Mike Greer in to build some homes and, and they can voice their concerns to me and to the city, and I, they've done that. But I don't feel that you know we're adding to that. We've tried to make sure that we're not going to be caught, be part of a problem, and that if they choose to drive or park in the in the street, that's their choice, and they're doing that out of convenience. But they do have other options to park in their garages or their driveways, and so I just want that to be taken into consideration. We're not trying to be part of the problem, and we understand it's a dead end. And I'm very familiar with building on dead ends, and I, I'm very confident we can do a nice job. And I stay in really close communication with the neighbors. I'm not a bad guy. They'll have my cell phone number. They already do. And my number is on my board that I put up. It's like a four by four board that's going to have the construction rules. And really, uh, one of the neighbors mentioned a complaint about um, parking for construction. Well. My crews typically just work from 7 to 3.30, maybe 4.30, Monday through Friday. There's an occasional sub that might work there on a Saturday, but that's rare. So most of the time, when they're at work during the day, uh, they'll be parking on the street, but they go home then at night. So it's not a constant you know, interruption. I realize that I'm not trying to interrupt people's lives, but I do have to build a house. And like I said at the Planning Commission meeting, their house had to be built once too. So. Everybody has to share a little bit of the pain once in a while to have a house built, but I do work really, really hard to make sure that it doesn't inconvenience people and that we're not obnoxious or do things that are, you know, a nuisance or a bother to them. And we work really hard at that. 
Uh, the other thing I'm going to make sure that I do is I won't overload the project. So for instance, I'm going to schedule people accordingly. Uh, I won't have everybody coming at once. I'm going to pace everybody out in a comfortable build uh, schedule so we don't have to have a lot of parking in there. I'll also make sure that people are aware of this, and we've done this in the past. I let the owner, the you know, my contact person with my subcontractor, know what's going on there up front and ask them to carpool whenever possible. So we do whatever we can do to minimize the amount of cars that are going to be there in an average work day. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to touch on. Um, I think that's it. If you have questions okay. for me, yeah. Does council have any questions? No. I know I mean, in both meetings, um, emergency vehicle access has been ongoing. Yeah. And you don't feel that this second house is going to cause any new restrictions for No, and, and that's another, uh, I, you know, it's Time a good question. question. Very good question. And I, you know, I'm not pretending to be an expert on this, although I did some research on the DOT website. And I stopped at the fire department and measured one of their fire trucks, too. Mm -hmm. And so I made this little sketch. I didn't get time to get that over. I apologize. But it's a little sketch of the width of the road. And the width of the road, like I say, curb to curb is 26 and a half feet. Okay. An average passenger vehicle, I can pass this around to you folks, and there's a little stuff that I, on the back here where I got that information off the DOT website here. It shows it on the back. It has a little guide to the vehicle widths, both trucks and semis and everything. So I went off of that off the DOT website. And so here I'm showing an example of a passenger car and a truck because one of the neighbors who has not complained uh, has a um, delivery truck that he owns and does that uh, delivery truck business. And so I took his truck into account because in the website it says a truck with extended mirrors for towing. So I figured that would be the same width as what his truck is like. And so if you take those two, a truck and a car, and you subtract those away from the width of the road, you're still left with 10 foot 10. The width of a semi with the extended mirrors on the DOT website says it ranges between 8 foot 6 and 9 foot maximum. That's what's allowed on the roads for semi drivers to, to have a truck on a, on a public street in the state of Minnesota. And it said that an average fire truck is 8 foot to 9 feet wide. So that still leaves some room to get through there. And now, you know, according to my calculations, a truck can get through there. And uh, on my little other, there is a, a fire hydrant right at the end of the street. And so, you know, I mean, this would be the same situation regardless of a number of streets that are in mound. They're, they're dead end roads. They have homes on both sides of the, of the road. And I don't know, because I don't, you know, live on a dead end street in mound but if, if there's been issues with that or not. But like I said, I have three car garages proposed and I have driveways for both of the homes proposed. So I don't, I don't see the need for people to be parking in the street for those two homes. Okay. I live on a road. People are parking Sorry. on the street now, I, I believe it's been for con convenience and mm -hmm. choice during the summer. I, I live on a road just like that too and there, there's, there's plenty of room. Yeah, for the you guys work okay? I mean, there's room for the, an emergency vehicle to get yeah, up. Yeah, that's what I came up with, my math. Yep. I mean, it's a concern. I, like I say, I understand. If a neighbor comes in and has a concern, I'm all in on that. I don't want people to feel like I'm just coming into their home and into their neighborhood and you know, just jamming something in there. I've listened to what they've said, and I've tried to do my homework and looked at it objectively to see if, that's, you know, if there's anything that I can do other than what I have done. So I'm confident that it'll be, it'll be just fine. Great. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Thanks. Um, this is not a public comment, although I know we typically take quick comments, so I don't know if there's anybody who wants to make a quick comment or not. All right, hearing none. All right, so I got a resolution on page 1309. Uh, can I get a motion to approve that? Uh, actually, with sans number 16 and then we can add that back in later okay so motion to approve the resolution on 1309 sans 16. um i can do that and like uh rita had said earlier we're just approving the subdivision portion 
Um, so I would like to make a resolution approving a two-lot minor subdivision of property at 5123 Waterbury Road, uh, planning case 24-04, um, omitting um, number 16, condition number 16 to be resolved later. Okay, got a motion. Can I get a second? I second the motion. Okay, got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that passes. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yep. All right, now we're on number nine, uh, Surfside Parking Lot Striping and Parking Curbs. Um, and I just sent you an email to <coughs> Can you check your email or no? Not on here. Oh. I can plug it in, though, if you want me to. Uh, is it? It's I just a picture. It's regarding this. I don't know if you can do yeah, a picture. I'm not sure where I am. Do you want to come up and just tell us, do you know anything about Surfside and kind of what happened this weekend? I, so, excuse me, um, so our police department came up with a solution. We put up uh, signage trailers yep. um, that have a uh, dis uh, display that tells us what yep. you can and can't do. We put them up all over. Um, also, we worked with the public works to get cones yep. out um, to vi so people could visually see there is no room for trailers here. Right. Seemed to do the trick um, with uh, what I got from my staff and from our uh, officers working through the weekend. We had uh, 13 spot checks with no violation. There was one citation issued, um, but we continually went through, rolled through that lot this weekend and we seem to have uh, had that problem solved for now. Other, I, I don't know if it was the weather or if it was what we had put in place prior to this weekend that right. assisted that. When you say spot checks, what does that mean? Spot checks are um, typically our officers will, if there's downtime if we're not on a priority call or have a priority call waiting for us, they will take their time to go and find an area that needs a, what would be maybe considered directed patrol where okay. myself as a supervisor or it comes down from the chief that, hey, we need to watch this area closely. Um, and my officers get that through uh, email or through my direction at night or during the day and they'll go and take some time to either take a walk through there, take a drive through there, just check things as they need it. So over the two days, 13 times you guys did the rounds? Yep, and this, the, the stats that I got are a little skewed because we ran into an issue where our officers, typically when we go out on a check, we can hit a button on our computers and it field generates and drops a GPS location, yeah. which can range from this area to this area. Mm -hmm. So what we've found and a direct has been put in place is from here on out, the guys put in um, Surfside and it populates as 999 Surfside. Okay so that we now can condense all that information that the officers are gathering on their spot checks okay. into one um, spot. Okay. Um, did you get, is it gonna work or not? Yep. I thought you did a great job down there this weekend. Um, <clears throat> I thought you did a great job down there this weekend. Thank I you. thought the sign and the cones were great. And then I know there was that big issue, manhunt you know, first thing in the morning that yes, we had a officer park. couldn't get the things in that say, you know, single vehicle parking mm -hmm. only. And I think it was partially the weather. There wasn't a lot that's, of activity down there. But I think that's, you know, if people can't read that, and that, or like that person you gave the citation to, Officer Senek and Thomas had already called to get that towed. Mm -hmm. The balls he had to park in that spot all day was, was un unreal. You know, there's nobody there, and he pulls up and takes up 12 spots and pulls up horizontally on it. Mm -hmm. So they called to get it towed, and then um, somebody in Chapman Place called. We watched him call, and he showed up right before the tow truck did. But, you know, I think, so 
up until this point, they used to tow for years. The last five or six years, there have been no tows. Mm -hmm. And we, I've understood now, I talked to Officer Beanick and also Officer Sonic down there. And they said, you know, your hands are kind of tied in a lot of instances to tow. That's why that's changed, because we didn't used to have this problem mm -hmm. when the towing happened. But I think this is a great solution. Um, Memorial Day was a bust kind of for weather, but, you know, as the things warm up, I think it's a great solution. I hate to see us put, you know, we've been doing this forever. I hate to see us change it. I think enforcement is key. All three officers also said the most important thing will be to get, you know, like a field officer down there or a peace officer for the first month just until people understand that we mean business, that we're not going to allow this to happen anymore. And then hopefully it'll, you know, take care of itself. But I thought you guys did a great job. Thank you. We just so you, uh, council knows that we are implementing our CSO will start June 1st. Um, his dates will be June 1st, 8th, 23rd, and 29th. He will work 1100 or excuse me, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So uh, 1 8. Sorry, the 1st, the 8th, the 23rd, and 29th. Perfect. And 11 to 5. 11 to 5 through the day. And that will include him checking for those um, independent businesses that are coming in. To rent yep and did you get a copy of what the registration looks like yes okay, um, supposedly we're working with a, a QR code also yeah they're supposed to be developing one and from what I was briefed by my chief that this this is supposed to cover everything in our that city so if there's a, a or no or excuse me amount owned um, launch they they can't go down there a bypass here and go down to the other one like on three points or whatever there's one down there so does that make sense that's what I was told the QR what are you talking about with the QR well the the whole like the law or the ordinance and stuff for that for Surfside does apply across mound for yeah. any um, yeah public for any of the public access right. so they can't bypass us being there to go and launch at another one um, that's they can, that, but <laughs> they can, yeah, but they, they shouldn't. Have, like, but if someone does yeah. call in a complaint, we can yes. respond yes. And, and do that. Correct. Yes. They have already gotten cagey. You know, they, they discovered a launch at the end of Tuxedo, you know? Mm -hmm. And then they were using Swenson Park to do their staging. Yep. Then they went down to the end where, you know, there's always a miniaturista policeman there. There's yep. nowhere to park down there. But yeah, they've been doing that the last couple of weekends. So. Yep. And we found they're bypassing us and going to Maxwell and yep. North Arm yep. So that's. But, hey, not you our know what? We're, it's solving our problem. So that's the good news. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, any questions? That, you know, like I said, I can try to answer as much about this as I can. Um, all I know is we went out and did this. It seems to be a good, good start. Great solution. Um, and I, I promise you, our guys make constant rounds through there. And like I said, we just ran into a hiccup with how they're labeling it within our CAD system, mm -hmm. and our um, office staff can't get it to dump into a, a single file until we get everybody on board with that. So I don't know if you know the answer to this, and um, Officer Sonic, I think his name was Sonic, yep. and then Thomas. What does the ticket cost? Um, I'm like not sure. Bucks. It's a 40 bucks. It's a because, 40 bucks, yeah. No one you know, cares. I heard 30. Th that's not really any consequence at all for somebody who'd rather not walk four blocks yes. to that. So I like the towing thing, but I understand the towing, which used to work beautifully. And I'm not sure what you can decide what can be towed and what can't because the Orlando truck that was there both weekends, the last two weekends, um, they got the tow, they called Williams, but I'm not sure why they decided that was okay, but not all would be okay. Yes, I, I don't know what what Jesse. Down. Maybe you know. So I sat down with the chief with Jesse the other day, and um, you're you're right. The it's like is a state thing that it's mm -hmm. like a thirty five forty dollar fee. So for them, it's the cost of a good day on the lake going fishing. So a lot of people just don't care. And no, they don't. Some care. people will just park there. They'll come back to their car for something. They'll say, "Oh, there's a ticket," and they'll put it in their car. And they're shut. So then we drive by and say, oh, there's no tickets. No, you already got one. Oh. So they come back again. To do, no, he just, it said that just happened this last week and that they tried to re-ticket him again. Mm -hmm. No, he already just got a ticket. He just hadn't moved his car yet. 
So if you ask me, that's not a deterrent. Forty bucks, it and it's what is they said a pesty, pest, petty. petty misdemeanor. So in other that's words, that's why towing would would be a consequence. Well, we talked about that too, and I don't, I don't remember what he said on that, but it wasn't much of a solution either. I think it's a, a space thing too. I mean, it's just cumbersome to be taking vehicles with trailers. With a trailer, yeah. You know, the, you have to have a place to take them essentially. What can we raise the ticket price? It's like a state thing or something. Oh, is that it's, right? it's not that we can't do anything about it. So we were brainstorming with the chief and um, obviously, you know, he's heard us that this is a thorn in our side. Um, obviously, in the last couple weeks now, it's been pretty serious. You guys down there all the time giving tickets and stuff. Um, because of that meeting, you know, this is the result of it. Can you go to the next page too? Mm -hmm. So then... You can't really see the green cones, but there they are. So we put cones on every single one saying, don't park here now. I know you can just move that. So I just want to have a little debate about what people think about, first of all, that. Uh, second of all, do you guys want to put concrete, or what do they call it, like rubber concrete barriers? Basically, so you can't park a trailer no. in there. You the want to be able to have trailer parking yeah, during the week. Of course. Okay. So here, I think this was a great solution. Okay, and I do too. I, I, I don't know if it's a good long-term solution. So the second well, we not do this, then they're going to come back. Right, and the other thing is, I think this weekend, because it's new, any car coming in this way, they'd have to back into the parking space because these are meant to drive. Yeah, it's backwards. To park. They'd have to, so I'm not sure if a lot of cars really, in fact, a couple of the officers asked several people that parked on the side, did you realize you could park here? And they're like, well, no. But I think once people understand, I think those orange signs on top of cones say it all. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm. single vehicle parking is allowed. I like that, like, I walk by there all the time. And I went by there over the weekend, and it was great. I mean, there was, that wasn't full of trailers. But so the plan is to keep trailer parking during the week, just not on the weekend. Like it's always. So we can't really put concrete bare because I, I thought the concrete, if it was just going to be a permanent parking lot, like then putting those concrete things there would be good. But when I look by on the weekend, it looks like if I were driving there to go, like the cones, if I was in a car, I'd be like, can I park there? Right. Yeah. Like it looks like no one can park there. It looks like it's blocked off for like an event. I'd like to see continued I don't know what the enforcement is. before, you know, going to any greater measures to, to mess with the parking lot. Because in the summer when it's busy. Retrain people. Yeah, I'm, I'm well, like, I don't know. Well, it's through November. If, yeah, yeah. To November. I'm like, I don't know if it's a good, I mean, it, it, it's it's working, mm -hmm. but it just looks uninviting. Like, oh, I shouldn't go park there in my car, you know, even though you can. Well, again, this was a one weekend thing. This mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're doing this every weekend. This is a holiday weekend. Hey, by the way, we, you know, you can't do this here. And of course, nobody voted this weekend except for me. <laughs> um, so. And even if we just said, hey, no trailer parking at all, which we technically could, could do, we would want to stripe them the other way, mm -hmm. horizontal. Yeah. The diagonal thing's not going to work. Um, but you're right. I mean, with, with the long parking spots, I don't think people know, cars know that they can park there. I mean, some, you'll see them there. Some people know that, and I think once one or two do, they go, oh, yeah. I can do that too. Yeah, but the cones make you think you can't. The cones make you think that's game off. You know, it's like the Spirit of Lake is coming to town or something. Mm -hmm. So this, I don't like doing this longer term. I do like it as a one or two weekend thing. Hey, by the way, we don't do this. It doesn't matter though, because two weeks from then, or two weeks from then, or next year, you're still gonna have some random person like me that comes up with a trailer and tries to park there and doesn't look at the sign. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's all about you guys staying on that area and still enforcing it. But I think the long-term goal is like to have them stay on it and enforce it, but hopefully a little bit less. Like if we had a better sign and solution, they wouldn't have to be down there as much. Well, and, and again, we're going to try this guy for a month, um, the CSO, so that'll be good. But, you know, if we have him sitting in the corner, we don't really need to be doing all this and being obnoxious with a sign, you know, at our launch every weekend. Are there like, I don't know what word to use, but like, in lieu of a neon cone, like a more, uh, I don't know, a sign that was like, looks like it's supposed to be there, like in the parking lot, you know, that I don't know, well, like, it says you can movable. park here. Well, yeah, yeah, you know. I know. 
I don't you have any cars ideas, only but... parking. <clears throat> and that's what the orange signs say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, it, it's just retraining. Yeah. And and I I'd love to see the month of just regular um, enforcement to see if we can yeah. retrain. Yeah, like I want cars to know they can park there. And yeah, like... I I do too. I, I was down there several times and pulled pulled, but I had a truck. But I pulled in just so people could see you can park there. But I think once people do that, it'll be helpful. But yeah, it's 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 going to be a retraining thing for sure. Is the plan to leave that um, police trailer there for a long time? Like uh, that moves around. It goes where it's needed. Okay. It's uh, um, so if we have some like uh, festivities going on somewhere other outside this area, it might be there directing the other way. Um, but you know, if it's available, it's just a request to. Um, the chief or you know our, our CSO Josh he can always set something up well pass along that you did a great job this weekend Thank you. appreciate it so and you know just you know we I want to make reiterate that you know the guys are and gals are not s skipping it we are um, going through it but we end up with we have to prioritize calls of course. and if we have something a domestic or something happen it's the last thing on our list it's, it's not something it's just if I have an officer that's prioritizing a four call over a one call I have that's not them doing their job right so it, yeah there's issues there so that's what I would like you guys to understand we will our spare time between calls I, I know just watching my my stuff that I had they were constantly making loops through this weekend and one of my officers always makes a loop on her last uh, go around before mm -hmm. she heads north mm -hmm. for the night. So, yeah, maybe this is the best solution. I just didn't really have any anything else but to make it look like you can park there. Well, again, these cones aren't going to be there forever. Yeah. So this is a very, very temporary thing. And I think our um, CSO being there, I think he could be. direct them that hey, you guys can park there. I think that might yeah. educate them eventually over time and give cool. them knowledge. So. <laughs> I think the month of our CSO will help out down there. So. Okay. All right. Any other comments from you? Or? I only would offer that we talked about striping. I mean, yeah. if you see stripes, you know that it can fit two vehicles. Yep. I mean, a trailer, or somebody with a trailer wants to park, they're still going to do what they did over the weekend when there was cones and a sign, and they would obviously do that over stripes in the, in the middle of the week. but. I don't know if that's just adding more confusion or not. I, I mean, because I agree that if it's marked yeah. a little more clearly, you would realize you could park there with a car. Um, yeah, what if you put down, like you're saying, put down white stripes, and then during the week you just pull the cones off, and then. I mean, well, I, I'm, I would just. I, I, don't I, don't know. I, I know, I know. Yeah. I'm just, if you, is there some, I know they do this in like Europe or something where they do like a. <laughs> diagonal line that knows that hey, it's a full one, but it's also a partial one. Do they, what what's street law around here? With, uh, I'm, with not, that? I'm not aware of anything like that. Okay. Um, I think what the rules there, there's things like rubber curves or something, bolt down curves, things you can put put on and probably and possibly take off. I could not volunteer to park group or something <laughs> like that, but something that could be put down. The weekend and then oh. up mm -hmm. But I think what Jesse was saying, and I would maybe want to think about, is like we, you, you put the white striping down, um, and then eventually those cones aren't going to be there, and then people with a trailer would just have to know that they can park there during the week. But it might be a little bit of a deterrent. Yeah, that makes sense. On the weekend, you know, because then on the weekend we don't have the cones anymore. We just have the spots where they're like, you know, it looks like two cars, and you kind of have to. I guess be a bigger jerk Could to you just put like a yellow a trailer there. A yellow line or something? Some, yeah. Not white, so I don't know. Maybe you is there's gotta be someone out there that has had this problem. That yeah. shares a parking spot. Because having lines there does make it it you know, it makes it very clear that it's two par it's two parking spots. It's not just a boat trailer spot. Or do you not go all the way around over and you just you give a foot or two on each side so it doesn't look like it's a full block off? You know what we're trying to say? Like a dash, dashed line or something like That's that. What, yeah, like a dash line almost. Yeah, I, I think um, 
psychologically the best answer is going to be a sign that has certain times on it, similar to like a no parking on the street, 2 a.m. To, to 6 a.m. or something like that. Write that, that on the parking spot? May, yeah. Like in that, paint? That could be okay. the answer. So there's no way to miss it if you're driving over the top of it. Can we look into what that looks like? If you did like no parking on the weekend, however you want to verbiage yeah. that out. I think we have to remember too that, <clears throat> you know, I've got three years of taking pictures of vehicles. These are repeat offenders. They all know they aren't supposed to be parking there on weekends. So I really think before we go to all this expense and okay. all this money, I think we need to just see what happens in the month of June. Okay. And, and see if we can, you know, get a, you know, get these people that are the repeat offenders to understand that, you know, we're taking this seriously and we actually are going to enforce it. And then I think if, if we still are failing at the end of June, then we can look at more permanent solutions. It's probably a good idea. Because there will be an expense to doing that. <coughs> I, I don't see the difference of getting what some paint and some letters would cost. Yeah. So at the end of the June, when this doesn't work, then we yeah. can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. paint's, paint's yeah. the cheapest, and you can always paint yeah. it black if you don't like it. Yeah. Cover it up again. Yeah. I mean, get a stencil and go there and paint. And can you just give us some ideas? We, of we what need to fog seal it pretty soon anyway, so we cover it up if we don't like it. Oh. Try again. <laughs> Uh, perfect. Again, I, at the end of the day, we're still going to have these issues. It's, there's always going to be people that park there. At some point, we just have to come up with a solution and move on with our lives. Um, we can't keep confronting police officers on our own. We're the, we're a council. We're uh, not. That's not our job. So, whether you want to take pictures or confront officers or something, I mean, that's not appropriate. We need to have you guys figuring this out. But we also got to set good policies so you guys can enforce what we're trying to do here. So, and I'm not asking for your opinion on that, but I'm just saying, I, I'm sure you guys want something to know what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, so anyway, appreciate that. So any other comments or suggestions? Thank you. I know you're working hard on it. <laughs> Thanks for waiting through the whole rest anything. of the <laughs> but interesting scrapes. I, I see, see, I see a big of a seat, You see all the diagonal things. But see the, like, like, there's <clears throat> yeah, no parking yeah. during the weekend. Yeah, I think that's the I mean, they can do whatever you want. All right. All right. Uh, now we're on number 10, council reports. Uh, council Member Pugh? Um, I have nothing to report. Okay. Council Member uh, McEnany? Nothing. Okay. Council Member Castellano? Yeah, I had a few things, but I didn't organize my notes very well. Um, Jesse, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you still have that crosswalk video, like in an email that I sent you recently? It's like a two minute link. I believe so. I don't know if we can, if you guys can entertain me, we can look at it really quick, but I'm not sure how, how married to the, the idea of it I am, but just considering we have a few crosswalks right in downtown, we're adding our Tessa, we're adding uh, the city park, um, there's Grandview. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Grandview, Shoreline, and 110. Um, sorry, Jesse, I should have sent this to you. I can probably find it too, but it's just a one and a half minute video of um, another city that kind of came up with a pretty creative solution. Do you have anything else besides that? Yeah, two more things. Okay. Um, I also I wanted to call for um, a workshop on just deeds. They sent us that racial covenant review like a month ago, maybe mm -hmm. two months ago. Um, but I'd like to review that uh, before putting it on a council agenda. I think that would be good. Um, personal experience, just reviewing that with um, YZ when we kind of tackled that maybe a year and a half ago. It didn't sound like it was a very difficult project. Okay. They do a lot of the work. It's maybe a little bit of our staff time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what what the timeline looks like on that, but okay. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I just need to have a second for the workshop, oh, right? I, or I'd make a second. Okay. Okay. We'll do a workshop. So considering we, City Hall we also got on one of those properties. <laughs> <laughs> we. If, it depends on the night, but or the day, but yeah. We also 
want to talk about the police service. So, right? Yeah. I think we had two last time that at least two. Okay. So, I don't know what works for people, but we can, we got to figure out the time to do both sure. meetings. Well, we have, we meet on the 11th and the 25th. I know Leslie from Just Eats, who would like to be here for that conversation, mm -hmm. if we have it, would be available on the 11th. So, if that work to have them, I, I guess I'd just leave it to the council to decide. June 11th, you're saying? June 11th, yes. Um, <clears throat> but I defer to council on what dates you'd prefer. I mean, I, so you're talking about before our meeting, so at 5 o'clock. Right, unless you wanted to do an off night or something, but if it were to be before the meeting, 5 would be probably be as early as we could go. Okay. Can you give a refresher course on what this deeds thing is? So Just Deeds is, I don't know what the right, they're, they're a nonprofit, but mm -hmm. they will go through, I think in their email there was 78 properties mm -hmm. um, through Mound. Why is that on Plymouth have, have already done it? But in these developments, um, like chunks of Mound, they provided us a map to like this development, this development, City Hall was on it, Shirley Hills is on one, but there's still like racial covenants in the property deeds. So this is about racial covenants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and, will, and is, you know, this property can be only sold to certain, certain people. Every, do we have a reason to do this? Um, do we have a reason to do it? To get rid of them. To get rid of them. Yeah, they're just okay. on the deeds. They're, they're not, you know, they're okay. not enforceable. Okay, I just need to re, uh, read them. Thank you. Yeah, for... like they're not enforceable. It's more of just cleaning up mm -hmm. and getting, getting rid of them. Okay. So, so Just Deeds is, a, is an organization that was started by, there's, I know, uh, the Golden Valley City Attorney was mm -hmm. pivotal in, start, in starting the organization, and so it uses volu volunteer attorneys to come in and go work with private property owners to clean up the properties. Uh, the title that they released, Racial Covenants, that it, like, was mentioned. Religious are, they're too. not enforceable, or religious too, but th those restrictive covenants are, are not enforceable anymore. They're yeah. religious, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're um, basically there from a, era a long time ago. Okay, got it. And um, my understanding is that it's really these, this, these, this organization and the volunteer attorneys that are getting the work done and they just, they partner with the cities because mm -hmm. the cities have the ability to get the uh, information out there. Yeah. And that's, that's really, I believe, what the partnership is. Well, but yeah. that's what the workshop will be about. Yeah. I'll, I'll add too that they just require a resolution of support from a city that sort of unlocks the pro bono work from the attorneys and also Hennepin County a recorder's office then waives fees related to wait to removing these covenants mm -hmm. so the city is that's sort of the city's involvement in it getting the word out and then waiving those fees for people so I mean this is kind of testing our start time I suppose mm -hmm. like a five o'clock workshop is early but I mean, the 11th or the 25th works for me, or on an off night, too. It'll be fine. I'll try to read the clock better this time, too. <laughs> <laughs> so right. until daylight savings. <laughs> well, should we just say the 11th, then? Sure. Everybody go with that for now? About the job with Councilmember Larson. And then on the 25th, right? Well, we were, are we just, yeah, 11th or the 25th. Well, we got to. Do the place. <laughs> so you might as well do yep. that then, then I guess. Okay. You guys go with that? Well, so we have a workshop on the 11th and the 25th. The 25th is for what police? Yeah. We'll show up at 5 for the next two council meetings. Plus the 18th. What's that? 6 p.m. on the 18th. Oh. We were talking about uh, scheduling having Ellers here for our. Yes. Oh, yeah. Our, and on the 18th, the Tuesday the 18th at 6, we have to do our finance workshop. So put that on there too. Can you send out those three dates? Yes. To everybody, <laughs> and include the attorney. Is that the Ellers Ooh. thing, Tuesday the 18th? Yes. <laughs> yes. I figure you don't, probably don't need it. Maybe at the 18th because mm -hmm. it's financial. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll just look at how much we're <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I want to be over there for that. All right, so do you want to show this one? Yeah, so like, okay, so that is enough about that, but uh, th this is like a two-minute video, and I'm honestly just curious about all of your guys' feedback, if you think this is feasible or not.
This container is where you will find orange flags like this one. And this flag may save your life when crossing streets like this one. I think it looks good. You think, think you would do it? Sure. It's a simple idea to avoid getting hit by a car on a crosswalk. Six downtown York locations now have crosswalk flags. You grab one from a basket and walk across the street while carrying it. The idea is to increase visibility and safety. I think that this is going to be a genius move. It's, it takes two seconds to pick up a stick that has a bright orange flag. According to Downtown Inc., research from other cities shows more cars stop for people with flags than those without them. I think it's better, better option than nothing. Now, the Transportation Research, Research Board has determined that these orange flags are 80% effective in stopping traffic when people are crossing the sidewalk here. And it's in use in a lot of big cities across the country, including Salt Lake City, Utah, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. In York, Ed Weinstock, WGAL News 8. So I kind of envisioned them as like the same color as those surfside cones, like a big day glow flag you can just hold in front of you and you don't have to use it. it seemed like a pretty cheap project. Um, I don't think it requires a lot to implement. I'm sure some of those flags will grow legs and get stolen <laughs> and can be replaced, but yeah. I don't know. I wanted to see what, your, what all of your appetite was for that. Even when the crosswalks are done, I mean, they're just mm -hmm. wide and busy. As a pedestrian, I don't trust anything but myself looking for traffic. So yeah. I wouldn't want any of my kids thinking they're safe grabbing one of those, thinking anybody's going to stop for them. I, I, you know, I, those are problem crosswalks. For sure. I just don't know if this would give anybody any sense of reassure, you know, reassured that somebody's going <laughs> to stop for them. Yeah, I mean, like you're, to your point, I wouldn't expect it. Like if someone's not going to stop and they're not paying attention, but if it makes you more visible, was my yeah. You know. And there is something about making the crosswalks visible because there are people who, if you said there was a crosswalk um, at the shopping center by Wells Fargo going across the street, they tell you, no, there isn't because the visually they don't even see it as it exists. Um, and so, you know, in, in different studies they've done around the country, doing different things with crosswalks, painting them differently, um, this flag issue. There are ways of getting people to identify with the crosswalk and its existence. So it could be fun for a while. It might not be the end all, but it certainly could draw attention. Yeah, I'm not and get people married to it. I just mm -hmm. thought it might be a good idea. What about the different color paint? Because I go down other cities and yeah. you know, oh, I've got different things going on. Some of them you know, have I lights, wanted, too, at the road level. Mm -hmm. They're I like, wanted, uh, uh, you see uh, in your car. Yeah. I wanted bicycles on the crosswalks for uh, Commerce and Shoreline where the bikes cross. And I've seen ones where they have, like, brick roads, um, artistic designs. Yeah. So Do you want to come up real fast? <laughs> <laughs> so remember, we do have a road policy per se yeah, as we implement things we have to go through the study that we came up with but is this something that we could add to your list of is there anything paint wise or cross i mean any thing that you have to say about that there's a myriad of things that could be done there's i think the brick thing you're talking about is like a, a kind of like an overlay almost that there's different uh -huh. um it's not necessarily paint it's i think it's brick not really. No, it's not no, true brick it's, either. It's, it's like something that gets heated it's, on. It's, it's um, I, I can't mm -hmm. off the top of my head tell you exactly what it is, but the, there are different different things that that can be done. We could put together kind of a, a list for you guys to review of yeah. some things that are out there. I think a lot of the issue here is going to be most of what you're mentioning is county roads, so you know they're going to have to buy off on it and, and approve it to go on in those places, and then um, figure out maintenance for that if that's the city staff to, to take care of that type of stuff. Or, so once this uh, crossing uh, shoreline gets installed, do we remember, is there paint? I know there's the pork chop thing, but is there paint? 
Or is it just the overhead light? Remember? I, off the top of my head, I do not remember. Yeah. I've got to think there's paint. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's a little different because it's a, it's a bike trail, so it's mainly meant for, for bicycles. So I don't know if it's going to have crosswalk blocks or not. Okay. Um, anyway, can you can yeah, add I, some stuff, maybe some color photos of like what this could look like? And, yeah, and just share that at kind of as a Yeah, and yeah. then obviously, you know, what's the challenge to implement them? <laughs> Is there any studies or anything that say that these actually do anything? Just whatever you can find without yeah. spending too much time and energy on it. Okay. Just so yeah. at least we can talk about it again. Yep, we can put that together. And then Jesse and you can put it on the agenda or something. Mm -hmm. um, the, the actual flags, I mean, yeah, you're right, they're all going to get stolen. <laughs> I can imagine all the kids. But I do understand, and one of my friend's kid got hit by a car right where you're talking about. Yeah. Um, year or so ago. So, I mean, it's definitely important. That's, again, part of why I'm sitting up here is that crosswalk that I'm still waiting on <laughs> get, getting in. Thanks, my council. But, yeah. you know, obviously once it's in, it'll be great. I will say, since the start, and this, you were there when I was talking about it, mm -hmm. I said, we're missing the boat if we don't talk about the other one. Yeah. And we never talked about the other one. This was the previous council, yeah, but on 110. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you still got you fixed that problem, but then you still got the other problem over here. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe it, some of this could be a, a half solution for. I mean, the, yeah. the cost and again, for whatever reason, we didn't go down that road. But I, I think it was a workshop, and I said mm -hmm. we have to do both. We can't do just one. We have to do both. Those are the two in our town, but we're doing one. So. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, with the stoplight there, it's yeah, really tough to do it. Again. We have to get the county to do it because it's a county road. Well, it's the three of us again. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, but I think 110 has many problems because 110 has um, Commerce um, Shoreline intersection. It has the Commerce Bike Path yeah. crossing. Then it has. Um, what, you know, Lake, um, Old the Lake bank. Shore. Yeah. And going the other way, it's, you know, if you're going north, you've got the entrance to the shopping center. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the library. And, and then farther down the school. So there are a lot of intersections there. I've often wondered, in Wyzetta, I noticed that they put crosswalks at every intersection on the old Lake Street. Now, that that's sort of the bypass, but but I always wonder, has it helped in slowing down traffic? I put the, the um, I go down there every day. They put the state law pedestrian yeah. sign yeah. thing. Maybe uh -huh. that would be a better idea if we had those everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have those out right now? Even we well, that'd be a good idea for yeah. that main road. But <laughs> again, they're all they're going to get trashed. These people are going to run them over. You know what I mean, though, the ones like the big, yeah. big heavy base. They had those for slow roads, and it works perfect. Yeah. So right on my way home, I hit one or two, you know, <laughs> then people come across and to stop, other people right. stop, and I'm like, you don't have to stop unless there's someone there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's better that they stop than they don't. Yeah. You know. Okay. But that would be a good idea. I don't know if that's something we can even do with the, with the county. But. Yeah. We can ask. Okay. See what their, well, what their policy See what is. you can find out with yeah. crosswalk. Especially that one, but then maybe, you know, even a temporary solution for the other one until this actually gets done here, hopefully the fall or early in the spring, I guess. I think it just would be good to, you know, maybe maybe put it out there that we're trying to do a little something more than we need to. And, yeah. you know, I get the flags maybe aren't the best idea, but if it gets us to something, it's fine. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Any other things? Um, yeah. Um, Okay, we already talked about trailer parking, so, <laughs> um, so I think pretty soon, and I, you know, I don't have all the details tonight that I should, uh, but just to get the ball rolling, I think it's something we're probably going to have to talk about more often pretty soon. But I'd probably look for an assist from Jesse and Scott for this too. But we should probably start keeping up more on what the state is doing with cannabis licensing and figuring out what we want to do as a city because that legislative session just ended what we perfect, can ask. Perfect timing. 
Perfect timing. I the, I just was I sent an email <laughs> out to to staff today um, about the changes legislatively that okay. occurred. So we're looking into that right now. Okay. I mean, so there is um, based basically what we're looking at is early cultivation. That's the only thing really that that can happen. Um, and so we're going to be reviewing city code to see what needs to be done. Some other cities that represent, well, let's just say one city already did something, but that was even before this the law passed. They just were got ahead of the game. So in any event, staff is looking at that. Um, we're still waiting for the Office of Cannabis Management to put out um, model ordinances. That and that's for the licensing. And that won't happen until sometime in 2025. So we have time, but. Um, they were supposed to supposedly we're supposed to get model ordinances like really soon under okay. the law, but I don't see that happening. Okay. So which means that and we won't be the we won't be the first city. The the cities in the metro probably and the ones the other ones represent will start putting together what they want to put together. We'll we'll we can pair it off of that or give examples of what's going of it's going on and then once the Office of Cannabis Management starts putting things out at some point we can always amend those ordinances. So that that's kind of where we're at right now is, is, and it was today the league came out with saying that with regard to cultivation, you may want to review your code and talk and look at your zoning code and those kind of things. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're working on behind the scenes. So like, mm -hmm. uh, um, not just cultivation, but like as a dispensary too. Yeah. My understanding from the, that is just cultivation right now. There okay. is no there is no license to, to be a dispensary right now. Okay, so we don't have any any deadlines looming over our head about needing to get. Okay, because I know that well, the state decided like if it was twelve thousand five hundred people or less, you know, one license. Right. That, at that, least. But no early license. They, they, I think the rationale for the cultivation is they need something to sell once they actually do the licenses. That's mm -hmm. and the, you only can sell. My understanding is anything that's been grown in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So. There's no From seed to sale is what they're calling yeah. it. Yeah, so if there is no cultivation license early, then you, you, you and once you give the licenses, it's like another delay. That's what they're, they're, they're looking at. So, um, what, but anyways, that, that came out today. Um, I've been in contact with staff on that, and uh, we will be discussing those items that need to be, if there's any changes that need to be made, I believe... I don't have it in front of me. It was sometime in July. It was when the, the the cultivation could start. I think it was near the end of July. I don't have that in front of me right now. Okay. My, I guess my main question was: so I have like the OCM's last presentation, and they were saying municipalities pursuing licensure are exempt from the lottery process if they're going to have a lottery process. But like we don't even know. We're not anywhere near to that point yet. Like the state's just looking at cultivation right now. That's my thing. So. I'm just take a quick look here. Hold on a second. I just didn't want to, you know, get caught behind on something that we should. Yep, do. and that's and yeah. I've been, I I I've been, I did send that out. It, so that came out, like I said, that came out today okay. from League, and it was brand new. Okay. I get that because I, I get an email. It's like the League updates, yeah. and that was right. You probably saw, saw that too. It's right on top. So. Okay. I didn't even and see. And I. I'm trying to look. Um, so we were we were in, I'm just trying to see what if I, I feel see. like I'm regurgitating what what Rita said before about like the concept plan I'm like just for discussion yeah yeah so it's, it says here legislative the legislation requires the OCM to begin accepting applications for so social equity applicants on July 24th the applicants closing on August 12th 2024 so okay um, so what we're gonna do so it, there is time because that's the concern too. Mm -hmm. But what we will do is, we are doing, is taking a look at what the new legislation is. Let's take a look um, at our city code. We'll take a look at what some other cities have done too, for as an example, and see, and then have uh, suggested changes that, for, the, for the council. Mm -hmm. And if it's zoning related, then obviously we'll go through the planning commission, then to the council. So, they said there is some time, but you know, it's better to jump on it now that we know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, hopefully, well, I didn't speak out of churn. Okay. Anything else? Nope. All right. Um, you, I don't know if people have heard, but the bonding bill didn't happen. Uh, 
not good for us, but not good for anybody. So nobody got money from that. Uh, end of story. So we'll keep fighting for next year. Um, remember, we put in for the, uh, was it four or three for the federal? 3.1. 3.1. Uh, so we got that um, through uh, the federal side. So hope, hopefully uh, we'll get approved on that. Again, we submitted four last year and got one, or just under one. Did you say 3.1? 3.1 million. 3 .1? Uh, 3 .1 okay. million is what we uh, got accepted or submitted for the congressionally directed spending. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was, uh, was it Congressman Phillips or was that well, Klobuchar? Actually, both, it's, it's, it's actually been three. submitted on both sides, and yeah. so yeah. that's helpful. Okay, but okay. Phillips' office. Phillips was coordinating. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all I got. Besides, and then I just have a question for you when you do your part next. Uh, public work director, did we get any update on that yet? We have uh, an offer that um, I thought today I'd hear about, but we're, we're planning on a mid-June start date. Uh, actually, third week of June, pending one final conversation with their employer, so we're okay. <laughs> keeping it uh, pseudo public for now. But um, we'll send something out once the paperwork's been signed, and then okay. next step will be to cart them out in front of the council and put cool. them on the spot, I suppose. Uh, How many applicants did you get for that position? Not as many as we would hoped. Um, it came out to seven, I think. Okay. Um, but in asking around, I guess it wasn't that shocking um, for a number of factors or a number of reasons. But we're really happy with uh, who we landed on. So um, yeah. sort of doesn't matter if you get a hundred or Great. two if they get a good mm -hmm. one. So good. Uh, so number eleven. Any other information from you? I know the fish fry is coming up Saturday. Right. I would just say that most of it was covered uh, among the conversations we had. We, speaking of the bonding bill, the, the money from last year, of course, like I mentioned, that, that's been signed into law. So I'm working with Matt to sort of put together a game plan. We're really excited to just come here and start rock and rolling, but there are some hoops we need to jump through with the PFA. So soon here we're going to come back with some requests of the council to sort of lay out exactly how to move forward because there's certain things we need to do in order to get reimbursed other things we can just kind of do on the fly it'll all make sense but mm -hmm. that's happening and we're just we don't want to jump in head first and then tell you you have to wait another three months before you hear from us again so um, that's coming but it's it's on the forefront as always uh, but it's going to be exciting and I'm sure very fast paced for a while there, but um, disappointing there wasn't a bonding bill, but like you said, it's not like anybody else got anything either. So. Right, right. Just want to let you know. Okay. And again, that's top priority. Mm -hmm. It's just behind the scenes, you guys are working through the details so we can get something in front of us. Correct. Cool. All right. Does anybody else have anything else? All right. Well, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. And I'm going to get a second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Hi. Those opposed? All right, we're adjourned. <laughs>